Welcome to the fourth presentation in Unit 1, and it says math makes your life easier. Okay, so the first thing we say is do not worry about your difficulties in mathematics. I can assure you that mine are still greater, Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein was actually an interesting case because he uh, actually failed algebra several times before he was able to actually um, get past the course. And although he was brilliant, um, he was not on par with the mathematicians as his era for physicists. So he actually was more of a theoretician and would, would put forth the ideas that other people would work out the math for. Now, he was brilliant in his own right and was able to do the math that, that's more complex than we do, but he was nowhere near on par with some of his fellow um, physicists at the time. So, learning objectives. So students should be able to do, uh, describe the origin of an equation uh, that we'll use throughout this course, rearrange variables to solve for an unknown variable, and identify the limitations of equations, if it has limitations. So you should already know that graphs can be uh, used to show the relationship between variables, and those variables that are correlated move together. Now, if you have variables that are causal, and that causal means that one causes the other, uh, and that does require an experiment to verify. So once you establish that causal relationship, you can convert this equation, this graph into an equation. So here's what we learned in the lab. That data from graphs can be converted into equations. That equations have the ability to predict values that you don't directly measure. And that's the whole reason for developing a graph and an equation is the idea that you can uh, have an equation so you don't have to always perform the experiment. You can say, well, based on what we know, this is what it'll be. So all scientific equations come from this idea of empirical evidence. So the key thing is that the origin of all equations is based on empirical evidence, which means uh, the variables were determined to be correlated, which means they move together. And then after that, experiments were conducted, repeated, expanded, verified until a well-established causal relationship was observed. So really, the whole reason behind developing an equation is to be able to predict what the relationship is without actually having to do the experiment. So repeated measure, uh, repeatedly measuring is time-consuming. So whenever you have this time-consuming, like if I had to measure the density of a substance and I always had to do it. I had to get a mass out and I had to get the volume out for everything that I wanted to do. It's time consuming and it's not practical. So you get these well established relationships and you can move on from there. So using a graph without the equation part can be highly inaccurate. Uh, whenever you're interpolating data directly from a graph, you're basing it on estimates between values and how do you know that it's 750 and not 748 or 749.3? Um, it's really almost impossible to tell, so you really don't want to use interpolation from the graph if possible, or extrapolation from the graph if possible. So really what you want to do, the whole idea of converting it into an equation is to take the human error out of it. So you can convert graphs into equations, and most equations that we work with are going to be linear, although you can see some examples of quadratic relationships or exponential relationships or logarithmic relationships or inverse relationships. There's going to be lots of different relationships, but the majority are going to be linear. So from a math class, you know that a line has an equation of y equals mx plus b. And so for this, we're going to look exclusively at this aluminum line. Now when you look at the aluminum line, you have a line and you can do the y equals mx plus b for it. And when you do that, you see that it has a y-intercept of 20 and you see that it has a slope of 2.7, and I got that just from picking two points on the line. So you have this idea of y equals 2.7x plus 20, and that's great for math class. In fact, that's perfect. Uh, but in science, it's a little bit different. So we only use x and y for position. So if we say I move in the x direction or the y direction, so x and y uh, very specifically mean position, and, and I don't have position here and I don't have uh, y position or x position, so instead I have mass and volume. So what I do is I trade the variables out. Instead of writing a y, I write an m, and instead of writing an x, I write a v, which makes sense. So now you have the equation m equals 2.7v plus 20. And now you can kind of stop for a second. You can say, okay, what are the limitations in the real world for this equation? And there are some pretty obvious ones. So if you have zero volume of a substance, so if I have an empty container, Okay, you should be able to say that the mass is going to be zero. Uh, 
Okay, if I don't have any Play-Doh or if I don't have any aluminum, the mass of that aluminum should be zero. But here I have a mass of 20. So there's a limitation to the equation that when I plug in a v of zero, that that I get a mass which shouldn't be there. Likewise, when I say that I have zero mass, I would get a negative volume term, and so that doesn't make any sense. Now the reason why you have this in this case is we can assume that this is the container that the aluminum was put in. So you have to be able to think through why do I have a slope? And in this case, we must have put the aluminum in some sort of beaker or some sort of container that had mass, and that's the only reason why we have a y-intercept. Now if you look in this case, we have, if you were to continue this line, this copper line, it actually goes below the x-axis. And so that doesn't make any sense. So there must have been some sort of error with the scale or with our measurements or with our line of best fit in order to get a negative value. So it's really important that you look at the limitations of your values. Now, once again, we have this idea of m equals 2.7v plus 20, and that makes perfect sense for math, but once again, that, that 20 doesn't make any sense, and I showed you why we can kind of disregard that 20. If we take out the mass of the container itself, then we can say, well, what, what makes physically sense is m equals 2.7v. Okay, that's great. So this 2.7v represents the slope of this line. Now the slope of the line for copper and the slope of the line for aluminum are different. You have different values there. So, so we know this slope can change based on the substance that's there, so we can say m equals the slope times v. But we call this thing a special relationship. The relationship between mass and velocity, we actually give a special name, it's called density. So the origin of the density equation actually comes from measuring this relationship between mass and volume, and you get the equation m equals dv. Now a lot of times uh, you won't see this equation written this way because most of the time whenever we're looking at the relationship between these variables we measure mass, we measure volume, and really what we're interested in is the density. So we're more often to calculate the density and so because of that we rearrange the equation to actually say density equals mass divided by volume and you can actually find that on your formula chart. But if you noticed the origin of this simple equation comes from experimental data and then making that data fit a particular um, function. So empirical evidence is always the basis for all science. If you don't have empirical evidence, it's not considered to be science. It can be a philosophical argument or it can be something else, but it's not science unless there's empirical evidence to justify it. It's also important that you understand that equations have limits. Okay, So this density equals mass over volume equation works for a certain limit. Okay. Now, if you were to have a black hole, let's say, and when you have a black hole, the volume gets to be infinitely small. So if you have an infinitely small, which is basically zero volume, any mass is going to result in a density of infinity, which doesn't make any sense. So realize that there are limitations to what we have as far as this density equals mass over volume, just like you do for speed. Speed equals distance over time, but speed is actually a limiting factor you cannot go faster than 3 times 10 to the 8th, which is the speed of light. So any speed that you get that's going to be higher than that or lower than that represents a flaw in the equation. So all the equations that we're talking about in these classes work the majority of the time. They work for um, the majority of our circumstances. Like for example, Newton's law of universal gravitation, which you'll look at in physics, is this. And it works the majority of the time. It works for planets, it works for moons, it works for asteroids, satellites, but it doesn't work for black holes and it doesn't work for light. So Einstein was the one who, re who moved this equation just a little bit to, to expand the limits of this equation. But equations do have limits. So what steps must be performed if an equation is going to exist between two variables? Uh, the first thing that you have to do is you have to establish some sort of relationship. Once you've established the relationship, you have to do an experiment to show causation. Uh, you have to numerically define that. You have to expand the equation to a variety of circumstances, and hopefully you can find the limitations of those experiments as well. It says the graph below is generated for E as uh, energy and F as frequency. It says the slope has a special meaning and is therefore called H. This is write an equation based on this graph. So I can start off with y equals mx plus b. And the reason why I can do that is this is a straight line. So now I say, okay, instead of y, I write e. Okay, now I don't have the slope, but it tells me the slope is a special value called h. Instead of x, I put f. 
and then I can put plus zero. Now the reason why I put plus zero is my y-intercept is zero. Sometimes when I have a plus zero, you can just leave it off, and we say E equals HF, which is once again another formula from your formula chart. Now it says the equation below relating electrostatic force and distance is Coulomb's law. It says what would you expect the graph of force versus distance? So if I were to put force and distance here, I'm going to assume that all these other numbers are a constant, so they don't come into play in this. So really what I'm graphing is F equals 1 over D squared. Whenever you have this and you were to look at it from another perspective, you'd say, okay, well if I put uh, Y as F, I get Y, and then D is X, I get 1 over X squared. Now if you know from math class, when you get 1 over X squared, you're going to get a graph that looks like this. Now the question is this, is does this part of the graph make physical sense? And the answer is no, because you can't really have a negative distance. You can't be closer to an object than zero. Now we'll talk about the difference between distance and displacement a little bit later, but you can't be closer than zero to an object, so that doesn't make any physical sense. So this is our graph. Whenever you choose to rearrange an equation to solve for something, it's really important that you understand the basis behind this. And it's the idea of opposite functions and equivalents. So you should know this, but addition opposes subtraction, multiplication opposes division, square root opposes squaring, exponentials opposes logarithms. This should be really the only one that you might not be familiar with. And we're really not going to get into this until later in the year, so we're going to kind of leave it off for now. But you should know that if you have x plus 7, the way to isolate x is to subtract 7. If you have 2x equals 5, you should be able to say, well, I can get x by itself by dividing by 2 because these two are multiplied. Okay, equivalence means performing the same, the same operation on both sides. And that maintains the equivalence. So if you have 5 plus 2 equals 7, that's a true statement. 5 plus 2 equals 7. If I subtract 3 from both sides, I get 2 plus 2 equals 4, and you maintain the equivalence. So when you rearrange an equation, a lot of times you're working with variables that you may not necessarily know what they are. So you have like PV equals NRT. Um, this equation you don't really know anything about, but you should be able to rearrange it for N. If you look, P and V are multiplied, NRT are multiplied, but they're on opposite sides of the equation. So the first thing that I need to do is I need to isolate it. So the variables NRT are multiplied, so the opposite function would be division. So what I want to do is in order to get N by itself, I have to divide both sides by RT. When I divide both sides by RT, I divide by RT to isolate the N, but then I need to do it to both sides to maintain equivalence. And when I do that, I get n equals PV divided by RT. Okay, it says rearrange the equation below to solve for F. So you start off with CF equals lambda. And I want to solve for F. So I see that C and F are multiplied by one another. So now I take this and I divide both sides by, or divide this side by C. When I do that, I've now isolated F, but I have to do it to the other side to maintain equivalence. So you have F is equal to lambda over C. Next, it says variables are often given a subscript to provide more information about how the data was obtained. Subscripts are not variables and are not attached to the variable they are next to. So when you see P2, P2 does not mean 2 times P or anything like that. It just says the second pressure reading. So because of that, we want to rearrange for P1. We see P2 P tot, which means P total, is equal to P1 plus P2 plus P3, you want to isolate P1. Well, when you do this, you would see you got to subtract P2 and you got to subtract P3 from both sides. When you do that, you get P tot is equal to, or excuse me, P tot minus P2 minus P3 equals P1. Okay, and finally, it says lambda is a Greek letter used for wavelength. Rearrange the equation below to solve for wavelength. And why do we sometimes use Greek letters? So the first thing we need to do is we would say E of the photon is equal to HC over lambda. The first thing that you have to do is you have to get lambda on top. So you multiply both sides by lambda. When you do that, this cancels out and you have lambda E equals HC. At that point, you can start to isolate lambda. And you say, okay, I'm going to divide both sides by E. When you divide both sides by E, you get lambda is equal to HC over E. Now, a lot of people will just try and divide both sides by HC at the beginning, but then what that does is it gives you 1 over lambda. 
And the argument that people try and tell me is that, yeah, that's the same thing as lambda, and it's not. If you were to get 100, or let's say a 95 on a test, that's great. But if I were to enter a 1 over a 95, you wouldn't be as happy with that grade. So realize that 1 over lambda is not the same thing as lambda. So you need to make sure that the variable you're trying to rearrange for is always on top.